Today, Matrix, we are going to be looking at Darwinism. And just to give you some background history on who Darwin was and um, the global trip that he took. Um, he started off um, in the British Isles in the United Kingdom as a young man and um, in his 20s. And um, he sailed pretty much um, all the way around um, the globe. Um, first stopping off around the coast of South America, making his way to a very important set of islands, which we'll get to later on, the Galapagos Islands, this little region over here. He then moved on through the Pacific Ocean, went to New Zealand, Australia, and then made his way even here uh, to South Africa. At some point he would have needed to in order to refuel back to South America, and then he would have made his way back to Europe. And um, the importance of this traveling around the world um, really allowed Darwin to see an enormous variety of organisms um, in different geographic locations that seem to be very, simi very similar to others. Um, and this sort of sparked his curiosity as to how is it possible that organisms that are on completely different continents with oceans in between them, how is it possible that they have such similar physical characteristics? And so now we need to look at Darwinism. And this photograph of Darwin is a more commonly seen one. It's, it's of Darwin much later on in his life when his work would have been. And um, Charles Darwin was an English naturalist and who also studied theology. And I think that brings um, an interesting aspect to who Darwin was and um, how his religious background also influenced um, the way in which um, he created his theory and his research. And a lot of scientists during this time, this period of time, were um, religious. And um, there's a lot of conflict between religion and science. And I think um, someone like Darwin um, allows there to be um, some insight into someone who can be both scientist and have um, a religious belief. And um, often seen as uh, the father of evolution, essentially because um, he produced um, the foundation theory and hypothesis that other hypotheses grew upon and therefore created this very large overarching theory of evolution. Um, and at the time, I definitely don't think that he um, knew the impact in which his work would have. Um, and so his travels around the world, collecting, categorizing, drawing, um, all these organisms, which started off simply as cataloging and organizing and finding new animals and plants, then turned into something completely different and more complex and figuring out why is it that um, so many organisms which are thousands of kilometers away from one another, how are they sharing these characteristics with each other? Why are they these colors? Um, why are organisms these sizes? Why do they look similar in South America and in um, Africa? And so he did publish his work quite some time after he actually started um, his journey. And it was about 20 years um, uh, did he actually um, publish his work. And Darwin wasn't the only one working on evolution. There were lots of other scientists that were working on evolution at the time. Um, the main reason effectively why Darwin is so widely accepted is because of the volume of work that he had to work with, um, how quickly he published compared to perhaps other individuals, um, but it's also important to note that Darwin shared a lot of his information um, with other scientists who were also on the same path as him. And I think what's interesting is Darwin was working on his work separate from other scientists. And these scientists had never spoken to one another. He had never spoken to them. But they all came to the same conclusion. They all had similar hypotheses. And they'd never shared their work with one another, but they were coming to the same conclusion. And so it's, it, it was a nice indication of the possibility of evolution being true and being able to move from a, a hypothesis, 
in his time to a theory in which we use today. And so Darwin's theory is quite complex and it's not as easy uh, to summarize in one or two words um, like it is in um, Lamarckism, but effectively his theory is in order to survive, an organism must adapt. They do not change themselves to suit the environment. Instead, nature decides whether or not a trait is favorable or unfavorable. So let's just unpack this idea first. So first of all, organisms must adapt to survive. Yes, they do. They, the ultimate reason why organisms reproduce is because you need them to survive to continue on the line and um, to continue to reproduce. And um, it's important to know that he doesn't in no way imply that the organism physically changes itself and therefore is adapted. Um, remember, the organism can't change its genetics. Um, they can't suit their environment based on what they want to change about themselves. Instead, however, nature decides whether or not a trait is favorable or unfavorable. And what that means is the environment may change and you may or may not have a characteristic that might allow you to adapt to the change or you might not adapt to the change and even if you don't adapt to the change it doesn't automatically mean you die necessarily um, but it can lead to extinction but it can also lead to what we call niche differentiation and organisms finding different niches and so let's use an example to explain this theory so Let's say um, there is an environmental change. Let's say it gets colder and a population of rats that live in this environment are now experiencing colder temperatures. And within this population of rats, there is variation, which we've spoken about before. The rats um, are slightly different shades of brown. Um, some are darker, some are lighter than others. Um, there's variation in the thickness of their fur. Some have very thick fur, some have slightly thinner fur. And all this variation in the species allows for the opportunity of evolution to take place if the environment has changed and something else has become more favorable. And so now it's gotten colder. Perhaps what's happened is the rats with the slightly thicker fur variation are more successful in breeding. They're warmer, they're more successful in going out and finding food, finding mates, and so they reproduce and they pass that characteristic on to their offspring. Now it's important to remember that these particular rats are not using their fur more and therefore are growing a thicker coat, because that's Lamarckism, they're not using it more. They simply were born that way, they had a thicker coat, and they have the ability to pass that genetic trait on. Now, it's not 100% certain that they will, because we already know from genetics and calculating probability through Punnett squares that it's not for certain that they will definitely pass that trait on. However, they are carrying the trait, so there's a possibility of it passing on. And effectively, what you want is you want the frequency of that trait, that favorable trait to pass on. You want it um, to occur more often in the population and so that eventually it occurs so much in the population that it is the norm. It is the norm to find a thicker coated rat that would be able to survive the colder conditions. Now if we think about our other rats in the population, our thinner coated rats, they don't necessarily die off all at the same time. That's, that's not how evolution works. Instead might, what might happen is those thinner furred um, rats, they might reproduce less, or maybe not at all, and their offspring are still carrying that thinner furred gene, and um, maybe they have fewer babies, and then they have fewer babies, and there's a possibility that that characteristic may fall out of favor, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the gene disappears completely, because we also know there's something called recessive genes that might be hidden away in a population and are only ever expressed again when two recessive alleles come together. And 
if the frequency of those genes are very rare, then it's very rare for the recessive gene to show and to appear again. So now let's look um, a little further into Darwinism and let's look at some specifics. So a specific gene is selected as being favorable and is passed on. Now this is different to Lamarckism as he believed the organism changed its own DNA and then passed it on to offspring. And so that's really the underpinning idea that we must grasp at the end of Darwinism. He was referring to genetics long before Mendel was around. And so he, he had yet to identify what these, these, um, these ideas, these traits were, but he knew that it was something that was, there was variation, there were differences amongst organisms and you could pass these things on. But what's important is that it was the environment that was dictating what was favorable and either the organism had that variation or they didn't and they could pass it on. That is different because Lamarck thought that you could um, change your DNA by using um, your arms more, making them stronger, and, and then that can be passed on to your offspring. And that's obviously not the case. Um, another example, a quick example, would be something like animals living in mountainous areas need to have claws or hooves to grip on the rocks. So let's explain this via Darwin and via Lamarck. So Lamarck would have said animals in mountainous areas would have started off with smoother hooves. And the more they used them to grip on the rocks, the more the hoof um, perhaps was um, shaved down into a sharper point by the rocks, the more that that happened, the better they gripped. And then that shaping and molding of the hoof that happened in the lifetime of that organism was then passed on to the future um, mountainous animals. And they then improved that again by using their feet even more. And if it became more mountainous and more rocky and more difficult to grip, then the hooves would wear down even more and they would shape better to fit the rock. And that's how they would have acquired um, this new hoof shape. And then they would have passed it on to the future generations, therefore um, inheriting um, acquired characteristics. So that's how Lamarck would have explained it. Darwin, on the other hand, would have said, there's a variety of hoof shapes and sizes in mountainous animals, let's say mountainous goats. And those of them that can grip on the rocks better, can find food better, can climb higher and avoid predators and can reproduce therefore more successfully. Those of them that cannot die and do not pass on their characteristics. And so effectively, the environment has chosen which variation is successful and that then is passed on through the generations because you're passing your genes on. In no way has the shape of the rock changed the hoof and then that was passed on. Instead, you either had these variations in the shape of your hoof or you didn't. So let's just have a comparison of the two evolutionary views of Lamarck and Darwin side by side, just so we can get a clear idea of the very basics. So the environment's role in Lamarck is that it is the stimulus which causes the change. In other words, something changes in the environment and now the organism is changing to suit it. Whereas Darwin would have said, no, that's not the case. Um, the organisms are various and the environment is selecting which variation is favorable. Now, Lamarck would have said that this has been an active choice, meaning that the organism would have chosen to make the change, whereas Darwin would have said it's passive. They have no say in it. Either they have it or they don't. If we go on to something called fixity of species, meaning how fixed is that species in its ability to change? And, and neither of them um, agreed on that in the sense that it has nothing to do with how fixed the species is. They were both no. 
However, um, their tempo of their evolution was also very similar. They both agreed um, that it was a slow and gradual um, thing and that the collective change over time would have needed to um, be slow. And that's also because environments can also change slowly. However, environments can also change quickly. And we're going to delve into that in a different lesson where we look at other examples um, of evolution that happen very quickly and also other mechanisms um, that lead to evolution. So let's actually look at some details about his theory of evolution by natural selection. So natural selection is the mechanism that Darwin used to explain how evolution occurs. And so there are two central ideas. One, species were not created how they are in their present form, but have evolved from a central, uh, sorry, an ancestral species. And two, natural selection is the mechanism that drives evolution, which gives rise to an enormous variety of species present on Earth today. Now, his theory of evolution is that all life on Earth came from one ancestor, and we call that our common ancestor. And um, at the time, he wasn't 100 percent sure where the lineage began. But now we know that um, we would have evolved from a single celled organism and then through descent with modification, we have arrived where we are today. At the end of the previous um, slide, and also at the end of some of these slides, there are going to be links to YouTube videos that um, you are more than welcome to watch that will really help you um, grasp um, these ideas. And um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to link them in the Google Classroom so that you can find them there, because obviously it's, you can't access them through the video. I mean, you can't click on them this way. But um, let's look at natural selection. And so natural selection is this mechanism we've been talking about. It's nature selecting. And there are a couple of components that go along with natural selection. The first component is that there are variations in these characteristics and they can be inherited. Secondly, more offspring are always produced than can survive on the available resources. Um, and so humans are maybe perhaps a, 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 the worst example of this because um, we generally have fewer offspring and we have modern medicine and technology to look after us. So I'm not going to use humans as an example for natural selection. Rather, um, if you think of something perhaps, and we'll stay with rats because they're an easy example to work with. Um, rats make more babies than the environment can support. In other words, there's not enough food, enough resources to go around. But that's important because it allows nature to select what we commonly know as the fittest. And that then leads us to the competition for resources. And so these rats are going to compete for resources and those who can compete best are going to survive and reproduce and those who can't are not going to reproduce or not reproduce as successfully. Then those with these favorable genetics adapt, survive and breed. And please remember when we say they adapt, they are not changing themselves. Instead, they have an adaptation which allows them to survive and then breed. Once enough change has occurred through natural selection, a new species may be formed. And I see that I've spelt odd instead of of a new species is it should be actually is formed through natural selection. But um, this only occurs, a new species only occurs if enough physical and genotypic changes have occurred. But I'm going to get into that in another video. Like I said, there's a little YouTube link at the bottom here, but I'm going to link all of these videos for you in Google Classroom. Now, I'm going to do one more example with you to show you how natural selection occurs and 
how it produces a change in the population. Not necessarily a new species, but uh, definitely how we can select favorable characteristics. So let's take my frog example alongside here. So we have a population of frogs and they are green, red and blue. So they have variation. They're all the same species. They just have variation in their skin color. And the diagram on the side is um, firstly a collection of what they look like as a population. But the little um, diagram at the bottom is what would represent their gene. Now, let's say the pond they lived in was green. So that's their environment. And so you can see how perhaps the green frogs suited the environment better. And that meant that those that were um, camouflaged, the green frogs, were better camouflaged in the, in the green water and they survived, they reproduced. Whereas those that weren't green, perhaps the red and the blue, um, they weren't as well camouflaged and so they were eaten which then limits their ability to reproduce and pass on their um, genetics. And so if they were eaten and uh, eaten, they couldn't reproduce. Now, um, just because the green frogs were the ones that were surviving, doesn't mean that future generations couldn't also still have blue and red offspring because we know of the presence of recessive genes. In other words, even if in this population right alongside, if we ate the red and the two blue frogs, and there were none left, it doesn't guarantee that the next generation, there won't be a few more red and blue. Because even though we only are left with green frogs, they could be carrying the recessive gene for the red skin or the blue skin. And by chance, they've now bred with another frog that carries the recessive allele, and now they are producing a blue-skinned frog. So you must keep that in mind that even if you select out a few unfavorable frogs, it's going to take many generations to continue to select the unfavorable color before it will completely disappear from the population. Now, what happens then if the pond changes color? Let's say the pond becomes red with algae. And now the red frogs have a favorable characteristic. They're red skin. They might be the smallest frequency um, in population size. There might be only one or two of them that are red skinned. But it's more favorable because they camouflage better. The red um, allows them therefore to be able to find a mate because there's more of them around. Whereas the green frogs and maybe the blue frogs, now they are being fed on more regularly because the green is so um, stark and so obvious against the red algae that, that predators can see them more. And all that has changed is the environment. The frogs haven't changed themselves. They haven't used their skin more, they haven't um, uh, lessened the color of their skin to fade or increase in intensity. All that's happened is the environment has changed and it has selected a new favorable quality or characteristic. And in this instance, the favorable characteristic is now changed to red skin. Now, if yet again, we eat the red and the, uh, excuse me, the green and the blue frogs, it doesn't mean we've lost those genes and those alleles. We have simply um, made the red more frequent. And this might then leave our red frogs to produce, to expand their population, and it becomes more frequent. This then means that our environment has changed and therefore only those individuals with the favorable trait will survive. I want to reiterate that this is an example of evolution, but have we made a new species? The answer is no, we have not made a new species. We have done something called microevolution. We have selected a variation in skin color to be more favorable than others, and we've adapted to suit this change. 
However, we have not created a whole new species. And that would be something like macroevolution. And now we know that we haven't made a new species either because all of these frogs still live in the same population, in the same pond, they're reproducing with one another, which means that they're the same species, they're making fertile offspring. So this is one species with small micro changes. But to get a new species, you require far more collective change to occur. One last example that I just want to quickly touch on, it's a very common example, and I'm, I want to give it to you because it has come up in exams before, is the change for peppered moths. Now, this is a nice example because it's happened um, within the 21st century, this microevolution has occurred. And so that means actually humans were alive to actually witness this evolution happen. And it happened in a very short period of time. And effectively, this is how it happened. Um, there are birch trees in, um, uh, in Europe, and um, the bark of the birch tree is a white, pale color, uh, like this um, bottom um, image over here. It's a pale white color. And these peppered moths, um, they come in a variety of shades of white and black, just like the image you can see here. And so they have variation, like we've learned. And because um, the color of the tree that they live on and they spend most of their time on is a pale color, the favorable color is the lighter shade. And you can see that because the camouflage is really well against the pale color of the birch tree. Doesn't mean, though, that the black moths aren't made. Um, the darker peppered color is not made. It still is, it's just less frequent. Now, something interesting happened. During the Industrial Revolution in Europe, the birch trees that surrounded these factories in Europe were covered in soot. And a birch tree is supposed to have a pale, silvery, white color to it. But because of the soot coming off of the, the coal that was being burnt, which, and soot is like this very fine, powdery substance that um, happens uh, to collect on, on, on substances and walls and trees and, and, and everything, really, when you burn fossil fuels. And so what happened was the environment changed. A human activity caused the surface of the birch trees to be covered in a black soot. And so what was happening was more white shaded peppered moths um, were being eaten because they couldn't camouflage anymore. They weren't the same color as, as, as the birch trees anymore. And so now a new favorable trait was being selected for. And those with the darker skin winds were surviving they were reproducing, they were passing that on. The lighter winged peppered moths were being eaten more regularly, which meant they weren't reproducing as much. And um, effectively, that then led to be there being more darker winged peppered moths. Now, things have changed once more. We have gone through the Industrial Revolution. We've also gone through the Clean Air Act as well, which means that the amount of fossil fuels in the air and the amount of soot collecting on the trees has changed yet again, which means we have reverted back to the original color preference of it being a pale shaded moth. Now, these are the same species. They are the same species moth, but the favorable color has bounced back and forth between the two. Once it was a lighter color, then it went to be a darker favorable color, and now it's gone back to being a lighter favorable color. This is a perfect example of how the environment can change and select a favorable characteristic for maybe a hundred years, and then go back to being another favorable trait that it was before. We never lost any traits, nothing changed over the time period, except for the environment being the one that changes. Now, I haven't discussed at, at yet, as yet anything to do with mutations and how mutations might allow a new species to arise, but those will play a much bigger role when we start to look at how new species form.